Thank you for braving the weather and being here. By Egyptian standards, this is a tough weather, but uh, by Dutch standards, it is very pleasant weather, <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and to all those who are not here, but who are with us in this webcast that will be uh, sent all over, welcome. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Rob Riemann. Rob Riemann is founder and president and CEO of the Nexus Institute. He's also founder and editor of Nexus, a journal of essays for cultural philosophy. And he's a writer and a cultural philosopher and a profound thinker and activist. The Nexus Institute is a leading international center for intellectual reflection that aims to inspire the Western cultural and philosophical debate. In 1991, Rob Riemann founded the Dutch journal Nexus in cooperation with his dear friend Johan Polak, who passed away in 92 and who magnanimously shared and supported his valuable experience in publishing with Rob. To both, the relevance of a new magazine was obvious. In fact, it was intended to serve European culture and the European ideal of civilization. That's an interesting point, and it has its lights and shadows, upside and downside, as we will be hearing soon. It appears three times a year, it's published in Dutch, and most of the time these are thematic presentations in each issue. Or, if I may quote from Rob Riemann's own essay about the Nexus Genesis, he said, a journal with this era in mind, but not of this time. Society relevant, but not political. With space for the religious and philosophical questions, but not a journal of religion or philosophy. It's quality, intellectual, but accessible. And I think this in many ways rounds out or sums up Rob Riemann's own philosophy. For he has done a lot more because alongside Nexus as a platform for the written word, Rob Riemann, he widened the possibilities when in 1994 he established the Nexus Institute together with his wife, Kirsten Walgreen, and that was to make way for the spoken word. Now that the Nexus Institute organizes lectures, I've had the privilege of delivering one of them, the Nexus lecture, uh, in 2011. And uh, it's widely acknowledged as one of the outstanding institutes in the world and the quality of the people it draws, the audience that it has, and it collaborates with Tilburg University where these things took place. And uh, the lecture series, the Nexus lecture series uh, was launched with Edward Said and Amartya Sen, George Steiner, Francis Fukuyama, Sonia Randi and I had the privilege of giving it in 2011. The Nexus Institute itself represents a noble ideal. And I think that ideal was captured in Rob Riemann's own writing in a book called Nobility of Spirit, in which he talks about various people, including Walt Whitman, and where he says his vision is about life as a quest for truth, love, beauty, goodness, and freedom. Life as the art of becoming human through the cultivation of the human soul. Rob Riemann also, like me, and those of you who may have heard me speak uh, on issues of the book of culture and language, is also very interested in language and the meaning of words. And he is very similar to George Orwell in this, who warned us that our liberties were always at risk. Our liberties were almost always going to be attacked and that the primary way in which they were going to be attacked was the, by the subversion of words and Rob Riemann has a wonderful 
book I recommend to you on the eternal return of fascism. Topic he'll be taking on, I hope, today. But he said, and this is important for all countries at all times, but perhaps even more so for our country in these times, to be careful when words no longer tell the truth, when words turn into lies, when language dies, and with the language, we die. It is the first and foremost task of every poet, of every novelist, to write meaningful words, to write truthful words. And you don't have to be religious or a philosopher or a great expert on Plato to realize that a language cannot exist without truth, for words, if they are subverted, no longer become the instrument of communication. And so, for any occasion to return with new faces and new garbs, fascism is present in Europe and elsewhere in the world, essentially coming with the same corrosive and destructive effects. So today we have the pleasure of hearing this distinguished intellectual who has been reflecting on the European condition for a lifetime and who is as much a child of Europe as of the rest of the world. And so Rob Riemann will talk to us about the theme of democracy and fascism in Europe. So I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to join me in welcoming Rob Riemann to the Library of Alexandria. Well, uh, thank you so much, um, Ishmael. It's, um, it's a great, truly great honor for me to be here, and this is much more than about just being polite. It's uh, being here in Alexandria, being here at this wonderful library, makes me feel as if I'm deeply connected with um, profound roots of, of a civilization, um, which, which is so much Euro Europe's civilization. Um, <coughs> The topic uh, I want to speak about this afternoon for approximately 50 minutes, um, I realize it's a pretty gloomy topic. Um, and, you know, it might be odd to you that at the time when you in Egypt are struggling so hard to have incarnated into your own society core universal values and to put an end to sectarianism, fanaticism, violence, uh, and have your own liberal democracy in which dignity, freedom, and human rights uh, for everybody are respected, uh, and you have institutions to protect it. Um, with this struggle, and for so many of you, I presume Europe, Western Europe, in essentially is still a kind of example of this society of liberal democracy where human rights are and individual rights are respected, where we do have the institutions to protect it, um, that now I'm here to tell you a different story. And a different story uh, because all over the West, including my own country, the Netherlands, there are too many undeniable facts which prove that we are moving into a kind of opposite direction. Or to put it this way, that too many of the old ghosts of Europe, which include racism, which include xenophobia, which include nationalism, which also includes fascism, are returning everywhere in Europe. It is in Greece, it's in Hungary, Slovakia, Romania, it's in France, it's in Finland, it's in the Netherlands. And we also should not be that surprised about the return of the ghost because after World War II, two very distinguished European intellectuals, independent of each other, in 1947, Thomas Mann, the German novelist, and Albert Camus, the French philosopher, made the following statement. They both said, Europe don't make a mistake. The war is over but fascism is still there. So I would like to deal this afternoon with three big questions. First question, of course, is why? 
wide return of the ghost, wide return of fascism. Secondly, what's to be done? And thirdly, what kind of lessons can we learn from this? And when I, when I give my talk and when I speak about the situation in Europe, uh, I'm convinced that you yourself uh, can draw the lessons to be learned for Egypt of what kind of mistakes should not be made here um, in your process and struggle to have a viable democracy. First, the question, why? Why this return? And to deal with the why, uh, I would like to follow an example of one of my far favorite philosophers, uh, the Greek Socrates. Um, as you may know, in, in the dialogue to Republic, he, he, he does a very smart thing. He says, and he argues, that there is always an obvious connection between the values of society and the life we live. What we as people consider to be important, that will be reflected in the society we are together. Now, this is such a, an obvious thing that too often we, we intend to forget it, that we are our own society. So if we want to know what kind of society we live in, we, we, we first have to look at ourselves. Who are we? What is it that we think is important in life? And, um, well, a self-reflection now and then is too difficult for us. We have a very wonderful instrument to help us with it, and that's the world of the arts. And so for the next 10 minutes, I would like to use two films, two films, to teach us um, a lot about ourselves, uh, by what they depict. The first film, the first movie I would like to show you by talking about it is one I guess all of you know because it's a very old classic. It's, I'm talking about the movie The Good, The Bad and The Ugly with Clint Eastwood and the famous music of Ennio Morricone. Now, the story as you know, just to refresh your mind, is, is a very simple one. It's a movie about three gunmen uh, on a hunt for a real old-fashioned treasure at the time of the American Civil War. And the treasure, again, is a very old-fashioned one. It's, it's, it's a chest containing um, at least 400,000 coins, golden coins, value today millions of dollars. I mean, this is serious. This is serious money. Now, anything goes for these guys. You know, they lie, they torture, they murder, and... All the time they are, you know, looking out for a possibility to kill the other two because, of course, they want to have the money for themselves. What fascinates me most about this movie is what is not in the film. For more than two hours, you're, you're looking at the movie where there is no romance, there is no friendship, there is no justice, there is no mercy, there is no humor, there is no beauty, and remarkable, there is not even any sex in it. And yet, for millions of people who have seen this movie, you know, through all the decades, there is a deep truth in it. That's to say, there is something very profound we recognize in it. And that's this firmly held conviction that to be rich is a wonderful thing. That's a very deep truth in it, and we, we can relate to it, we recognize it, we can understand why those free gunmen want to go through all the hardship, because we do realize to be rich is a wonderful thing. Um, if we look now at nowadays present society, look at the causes of the financial crisis, look at the dominance of the economic news, Look at our idealization of the rich. It all has the same root. To have a lot of money is a wonderful thing. The second movie I would like to show you is another classic, but unfortunately almost unknown. It's the movie Stalker by the Russian cineast Andrei Tarkovsky. If you've never heard of the movie, don't be nervous about it because there are not that many people who know this movie, but try to get the DVD. Um, 
The film is set in the Soviet Union of the 1970s. And the background is a bleak, very depressing industrial town. Uh, there is a leaking nuclear plant. There's a lot of rain. Uh, it can't be more depressing and gloomy. Now, somewhere near this city and this leaking nuclear plant, there is a military site. And behind the military site, there is what is called the Forbidden Zone. And in the Forbidden Zone is, quote unquote, the secret chamber. Now, what's so special about this secret chamber is that if you go into this place, your deepest longings, your greatest desire, will be fulfilled. It's, it's a miracle place. And Stalker, the name of the movie Stalker is the, the, the guide who can bring you to that place. He's the only one who can bring you to that place. And one of the reasons he wants to do this work, and you're talking about a kind of you know, sloppy man, he's poor, uh, uh, his child is disabled because of the, of the radioactivity of this nuclear plant, uh, but the, one of the reasons that he is doing this is because he's a nobleman in the sense that he realizes that the secret chamber is the last resort of hope for people who are in despair. When you are in complete despair, when there is nothing to hope for, you can go to this place and your deepest desire will be fulfilled. Now, the movie starts with the fact that he's hired by, quote unquote, the writer and the professor. And they are two brilliant intellectuals but cynical, bitter uh, men. They are bored and they no longer believe in what they are doing. Or are, and they are, you know, they are ready for something new. They think, well, you know, secret chamber, desire, let's go for it. Let's, ha let's, have, let's have some good time. What they do not realize all too well, although Stalker told them, is that, that it is a dangerous journey. You could be shot dead. Uh, there are landmines, it is not easy to get there. But Stalker, being the good guy he is, he managed you know, to, to get through the dangerous uh, uh, zone. And after that, on their way to the secret chamber, he tells them the following story. He said, gentlemen, listen. Once I had a predecessor who became responsible for the death of his own brother. And burned by guilt, he goes to the secret chamber and he asks in this chamber, please let my brother be come back to life. So he goes out, he goes back home, he opens the door and you know what? He finds a house full of gold, diamonds, jewels. Because the secret chamber fulfilled his deepest desire. And the deepest desire is to be very rich and not that his brother would be back to life. And at the very moment he realizes this, he kills himself. And Stalker tells his story in a quite relaxed way. And he said, look, you, I, I'm only telling you this because you have to be aware of the fact that when you're there, you will be confronted with your deepest self. You will be confronted with the man you are, with your own soul. So they arrive, the three of them, and the two men refuse to go into the chamber. They don't want to be confronted with themselves. Now, everything what is not in the good and the bad and the ugly is in Stalker. This is about the spiritual quest, this is about love, this is about compassion, but after we have seen these movies, and when, you know, at, at the very end we, we, we can watch, you know, everybody who played in the movie, etc., etc., we, all of us, having seen the movie, we are confronted with some profound questions. Because what two movies have in common is that they confront us with the question, so what is it that you find really important in life? What makes life for you worth living? What is your deepest desire. Now these are, you know, the most ancient philosophical questions of all times, all civilizations. What is the right way to live? What gives life value? What makes it meaningful? 
they are philosophical questions, but they are not academic questions. Because inevitably, everybody, at a certain moment in your life, you have to ask these questions. Even more than that, it is Socrates who says, look, if you want to live your life in a meaningful way, these are the questions you have to ask yourself every day. These are the key questions. Now, the questions are timeless. Again, every time, every civilization, you'll find people have these questions. But the answers we are looking for have to be found in the context of our time. We are no longer living in the Middle Ages, and Chinese civilization is not part of our world. So, what is the context of our time? Now, for Europe, and here I have to be a little bit careful, but for Europe, the European context has been best summarized, in my perspective, by Friedrich Nietzsche. As you may know, he lived in the 19th century. He became a professor when he was 25. He gave up much, much later due to the huge migraines he had, but also he wanted to think for himself. And as a kind of prophet, he predicted everything that would happen in the 20th century. All social developments were predicted by Nietzsche. He went mad. But before he went mad, before he got into insanity for more than 12 years, he wrote down the following thought, I quote, Nietzsche. The most universal sign of the modern age, man has lost dignity in his own eyes to an incredible extent. Now, in this little sentence, which he just wrote down before he collapsed, the whole 10th century and so much of our time is summarized our boundless destruction of mankind and our environment. Now the question is, why? Why is it that life has become so worthless to us that we make so little effort for it and, so, and put so much energy in destroying our fellow human beings and the planet? Nietzsche's answer to this, to this question can be found in another prediction of him, which is Europe will fall into nihilism. And most of his work is about thinking about what's the meaning of nihilism. But his best summary is the following. Nietzsche, I quote, nihilism is that the highest values no longer no longer have any value. There is no goal. There is no answer to the question why. End of quote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a philosophical statement. This is a philosophical time bomb. Because what Nietzsche is claiming here is that all those big questions we have to ask ourselves every day, the big questions we are reminded of by the movies we just saw, Nietzsche will say, well, you can ask those questions, but the questions are meaningless. And they are meaningless because there is no answer to it. Again, why? Well, Nietzsche will say, because nothing has any absolute value. There are no spiritual values anymore. Of course, you can talk about good and true and beautiful, and people will continue to talk about this all the time, but... It is what you think of it yourself. It's nothing more. It's the most subjective thing there is. And when something can mean everything, it ends up being meaning nothing. Well, there are some people still think, well, you know, but there's a God. Well, Nietzsche say, well, I'm very sorry, but God is dead. That period is over. Look around. Have you seen him? I didn't see him. Who can show him? So look at the world in which you're living. The world is too cruel. It's too much a hell. There is no God. God is dead. And then he goes on, he said, well, but there's only one thing that will remain absolute, and that's freedom. But it will be an empty freedom. Do whatever you want. Everything is permitted. Indulge your desires. There are no spiritual values to limit or to stop you. And of course, there will be still laws and morals, etc., etc., etc. But 
Nietzsche says, look, the moral and the law you comply to are the moral and the law of the people in power. They tell you what the law is. They tell you what the moral is. So what's everybody's desire? Everybody's desire is to have power, to be in power, because then you can tell people what the law is and what the moral should be. So it is Nietzsche who anticipates more than anything else that European society will descend into violence, devastation, and endless self-destruction. And then he makes another prediction. He claims once people have experienced all this violence, when they are tyrants of their own violence and their own devastation, they'll try to escape from their own meaningless existence and search for a replacement for the spiritual values that have been lost. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I don't think, and I'm also not a sociologist, uh, but you don't have to have a very complicated scientific research uh, uh, to understand or to find out what we, at least in Western society, find truly, truly important. My, 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 my small uh, suggestion to understand what we really find important is that we go to any station, central station, or any airport, and we go to the newspaper kiosk. Because I, I'm traveling a lot, and at every place in the world you will find the same shelves, and the same shelves with, with, with the same magazines there, and believe me, those magazines would never be there if not millions or billions of people do have a real interest in it. Always, and you can check it out yourself, you will find a shelf on computers and technology. And of course that says something about the huge faith we have in technology, technological progress, that it will always be good and will remain so. There is always, everywhere you come, a shelf with cars and sports and motor racing which says something about the huge faith we have in speed. Everything what is faster is better because it's faster. Speed became a value in itself. Obviously, the big shelf on money. Money is God. We all know that. But there's also always this shelf about celebrities, about lifestyle, about sex. And again, probably cannot imagine a world without this amusement without this excitement. And the commerce and television and internet only confirm how dominant these values are in our culture. And so here the question is, why is it that we in our society give so much value to technology, to speed, to money, to fame, and to all kinds of pleasures? And again, it's Socrates who 2,500 years ago gave a kind of answer to this. He says in, an, in a debate with a friend, I quote, your lifestyle, my friends, is solely focused on pleasure, but you ignore the best. Now, this expression for me is a wonderful definition of a phenomenon which, which, which came to rise around the 1900 and is now unstoppable everywhere in this what I call kitsch. We are definitely in Europe and America living in a profound kitsch society. And the consequences of this are drastic. Let me outline just a few. Because there are no longer any spiritual values, there is no objective measure for our actions because everything is subjective. My individual I, my ego, becomes the measure of all things. And so the only things that count is what I feel, what I think, I insist that my taste, my opinions, and how I am will be respected. Otherwise, I'll be offended. The sensitive ego, as the measure of all things, follows for no criticism and knows no self-criticism. And then the thing of identity. Identity is no longer an expression of spiritual values of who you are, but of materialism, what you have, what you look like, 
you can literally buy your own identity, adapt it, and change it all the time. And I'm convinced that the permanent drive to buy and to own are not that much expressions of greed or consumerism, but relate to a deep, deep longing to have an identity, to buy an identity, and then to show it off to as many people as possible. And here's where Facebook comes in. Look at me. This is you know, what I have, and I want you to like me, and I want to have 300, 400, 500 likes. Because when spiritual life is no longer relevant, everything comes down to, 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 to feeling good. You want to feel good. To feel good is the most important new thing. And you feel best when everything is pleasant and therefore fun. Fun became the new ultimate measure for all things you invest time in. Your relationship has to be fun. Your friends have to be fun. School, studies, work, all has to be fun. And in your free time, you want to have amusement. And in the unlikely event that things go wrong and you really can't change it, give me a pill. Again, this is what's happening in America. 25% of young students are using drugs to feel good again. In a kitsch society, politics is no longer the public arena of serious debate about what a good society is and how we can achieve it, but it has become a carnival of people who want to gain political power and hold onto it with slogans and their imago. An economy in a kitsch society is dominated by commerce, that wants to earn money at the cost of everything, even people, environment, or quality, and requires all of us to be competitive, productive, efficient, commercial. Education has no longer anything to do with spiritual training and striving for wisdom, but it has to be useful, and what is useful is what is good for the knowledge economy. In brief, when kids dominates, Nothing has any intrinsic value anymore. Everything that exists is there because it is pleasant and or useful. Kitsch is the irresistible temptation of pleasure and beauty, but it is a beauty without truth. It's like using cosmetics to seduce and to hide, and to hide an incredible spiritual emptiness. Yet, at a certain moment, everything that Kitsch has to offer, the excitement and the kind of intoxication, it will be over. And definitely is over when there is a time of crisis, when we are no longer capable you know, to buy everything we need to continue our Kitsch life. And when the party is over, and when life is no longer fun and pleasant, there are worries, and there are crises. And even more than that, we are also deeply disappointed. We are embittered, because we have lost what was really important to us, and it turned out not to be really important at all. We do feel deceived. And then you get this second phenomenon that characterizes so much of our age, resentment. People become angry. There is resentment, there is hatred in the community. And that too has political and social consequences. There was Max Scheler, a German philosopher around 1900, who knew his Nietzsche very well. And he observed in his surroundings at the beginning of this 20th century what was going on. And he published in 1912 his book, Resentment in the Framework of Moralities. And he explains that resentment is a phenomenon that belongs to cultures with an ideal of equality. And Europe has had a culture of equality from the start. All monotheistic religions foster their belief that despite all our differences, we are all equal in God's eyes. And only one thing counts for God, whether you live your life righteously and faithfully or not. In European humanism, from Socrates to Spinoza, there is also this ideal of equality. True identity is not determined by your possession, your power, 
your family, your race, your sex, everything that differentiates us from another, but our true identity is determined by our universality, that which all men always have in common, the ability to live in truth, to do right, and to create beauty. But we are here still talking about universal spiritual values. But Nietzsche had explained to us that the meaning of those values will disappear. And so from the 19th century onwards, the ideal of equality has only been focused on to the material, in particular in the form of socialism with its ideal of social justice, equal chances, equal incomes, and the desire for a greater democracy, voting rights for all, etc. But when even these spiritual values are dropped because they are taken for granted, which is the case in Europe and in America, you're left with pure materialism and the ideal of equality becomes perverted. Everyone has the right to everything. So if someone else, so if someone else has more, I should have it too. And equality now becomes a crude ideology that starts to dominate everything. Since you always find the greatest equality at the lowest level, all quality, all quality disappears. Education, universities decrease in quality because not only everyone must be able to study, but also to graduate. And art and culture have to be accessible, not just affordable, but most of all, understandable. In the society of resentment, there is an enormous hatred a deep, profound hatred of everything that is difficult. Because difficult equals elitist, elite, el equals anti-democratic, and therefore should not exist. But resentment also influences our values. We no longer accept any higher spiritual values. They don't exist, they are too difficult. So all values become subjective and the new measure is I should be able to decide for myself if I want it, if I like it. The paradox, Shayla points out, the paradox is that this resenting human being is a weak person. He doesn't want to do things alone. He would rather conform, in short, he's a mass man who prefers to do and think what everyone else does and thinks. Resentment also influences our notion of freedom. Freedom in all our religious traditions is a difficult freedom. It's the freedom of to be responsible to live your own life in a righteous way. And again, for European humanism, Spinoza, Spinoza will speak about freedom in the meaning of freeing yourself from desires, from fear, from ignorance, from superstition, no longer being the slave of your passions. And only once you succeed in this, once you have learned to use the powers of reason to live in truth and to love one another and to do right, only then you are able to call yourself free. But again, both traditions, religious and humanism, presuppose that there are universal spiritual values which we can emulate. But again, they have gone. So freedom becomes everything is permitted do what you want. So here is the next paradox. In a mass society, mass man is a weakling and there is a huge fear of freedom. And there is a fear of freedom and what people essentially want is to obey to all of them or to anybody who claims to be in the possession of the truth. Now, Almost all great thinkers of the 19th and 20th century saw this social development coming. But again, it's most brilliantly summarized by the great Russian novelist Dostoevsky in this short story, which is part of uh, the Brothers Karamazov. It's called The Legend of the Grand Inquisitor. What is The Legend of the Grand Inquisitor telling about? It's, it's, it takes place in, in Spain in the 16th century, uh, Catholicism's heyday. And there is a religious festival, and because 100 heretics will be burned to death. 
and everybody wants to be there. You don't want to miss this wonderful uh, thing. So the court is there, the people are there, and the whole ch all church authorities are there as well to see how 100 people will be burned to death. But before fire starts, a stranger is coming somewhere from behind, and he, do, he does strange things. You know, a blind person can see again, and a lame man can walk again, and a girl profoundly ill suddenly rises from her deathbed, and the people see it, and they hear it, and they know Christ has returned. The cardinal, who is like here, you know, waiting for the moment he can say, you know, put the fire on, he hears about this, and he says to his God, this, this guy, this Christ, get him and put him in jail now. Of course, they have learned to obey, so this is what they do. They put Christ in jail. That evening, the cardinal goes to the prison, and he sits uh, across Christ, and he asks him, it's a, it's a, mo it's a monologue, and it, because Christ doesn't say anything, and, 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 and the cardinal says, what kind of idiot are you? What kind of stupid are you? Why did you return? We, the church, we, the priest, we have done everything already for ages to improve your work. You are an idiot. You thought that people want to be free. But that's nonsense. People don't want to be free. People want to be happy. And freedom makes them very unhappy because then they have to think for themselves. They have to make their own choices. They have to be responsible. They have to know for themselves about good and evil. And that's not fun. That's not what people want. And we, the priests, we, the church, are there to help them. How? By providing them with marvels, with mystery, and of course with authority. Of course people need to be obedient, or better still, they have to believe blindly in us. But they are happy to do that. They are no longer free, but we make them happy. And we will not have you to spoil this. So tomorrow, yes, you too will be burned. We do not know if that actually happened, but the story of Dostoevsky is this wonderful story to explain to us that the, that the, the fear of freedom is a very, very old phenomenon. Now I take you to the 30s, the 30s in Europe, the 30s in my own country, in the Netherlands. At that time, there is a Dutch cultural critic, Menno de Braak, you never heard of him, but he was a close friend of Thomas Mann and he knew his Nietzsche very well. And he writes an essay because he's surprised by the fact that there is in the Netherlands, in Europe, a movement emerging which is going to use the fear of freedom and resentment in society for political means. And with growing amazement, he makes the following notes. He writes, I quote, a political movement is growing, which is continually angry and is stirring up anger and aggression in society. Those people are not interested in real solutions. They need the inequalities in order to be able to carry on name calling. That's really the only thing they understand, what they can do, name calling and hating they don't have a single positive idea. The only thing they want is to be able to indulge in resentment. One thing that's remarkable about this new political movement is that they claim they are always the victims. They are always neglected. The others always have it better. Another remarkable thing, they hate intellectuals, they hate artists, they hate culture, they hate everything that is not as ordinary as they are. Also remarkable is that their leader keeps claiming that things used to be better. Throw out all the foreigners, let us be a single folk again, and everything will come good. Not remarkable, completely logical, according to Tebraak, is that the leader has to be a populist who says everything the masters want to hear because he will use everything to mobilize the masters for his own purposes. The title he gave to this essay is National Socialism as a Doctrine of Resentment. 
And as the PS, he adds in his essay that the elites and the intellectuals would rather stick their heads in the sand than look at the facts in the face, because they will say, it will be all right, it will sort itself out. Once the economic crisis is over, we have to do more research. But the Braak says, this is complete nonsense. The economic crisis is not the crux of the problem. Since fascism is the consequence of a crisis of civilization. And you don't need research to understand what it is, because fascism is rooted through and through in a total lack of ideas. We, living in the 20th century, we know now what fascism leads to. Always away with freedom, away with truth, away with thinking for yourself always away with compassion for your fellow human beings, away with welcoming strangers, away with the arts, away with culture, away with humor, away with quality, away with individual human rights. What's left is a uniform mass society and then violence, endless violence. And in my country, on the 4th of May, our commemoration day, we say, till today, never again. And because we say never again, we started to talk about populism now, because fascism, that cannot exist. We say never again. And yes, of course, there is populism in America, in Europe, in the Netherlands. It is very much present in our politics. It is where politicians exchange principles and visions and ideals for the false currency of currying favor with voters and drifting with the spirit of the times. While these characters driven by self-interest and imagination-less pragmatism offer is indeed populism. The true populist in politics can be found on the right and on the left, in the government and in the opposition. There are many, many, many politicians everywhere populist. But again, Greece, Hungary, Slovakia, France, Finland, the Netherlands. There is a growing rise of fascism. And of course, those people will never admit and say up front and say, oh, we are proud fascists. I mean, they are a little bit more intelligent uh, to do something stupid like that. And of course, they will also not wear silly suits and go on about saluting all these things. But those things have nothing to do with fascism. The fascist mind can be recognized by its vision of society and its political techniques, like a crude materialism, a stifling nationalism and xenophobia, a deep aversion to the arts, spiritual values, and therefore a deep desire to destroy the world of culture, an aversion to intellectuals, artists, and anyone who is different, a politics of resentment, hatred, and permanent lies. Always the scapegoat. It used to be the Jews. Now, of course, they are the Muslims. A fierce resistance to the European spirit and a cosmopolitan Europe with multiple traditions and cultures. A profound anti-democratic spirit. In those movements, there is no democracy and they ignore every form of serious intellectual debate. They prefer Twitter buzzwords, slogans. They hate the judicial power, and in their talk, you can hear the desire for violence. Mr. Wilders in my country is famous or notorious for statements like, we have to put all the Muslims on the train, get out of, out of Europe. And everybody in Europe knows the connotation of putting people on trains. Um, you can see it in the aggressive behavior themselves, and it all culminates so far in the repulsive actions of Mr. Breivik in Norway. But again, let us not be surprised that the poisonous plant of fashion is growing again, because as I mentioned, we have been warned in 47 by Thomas Mann and Albert Camus. War might be open, but fascism did not disappear. It won't disappear because these cancer cells belong to this mass society dominated by kitsch, run by populists.
That's to say, a society in which we have collectively forgotten what is important in life. And at the first signs of crisis, the fascist, the fascist cancer will spread again like weeds and slowly but surely the entire social body will be overrun. So what's to be done? My big next question. So history doesn't just teach us about fascism and why it always can return, but also about the fight against fascism in order to ensure the continuation of a civilized society. And in my book, Nobility of Spirit, uh, indeed the last chapter is devoted to an exceptional figure, uh, uh, a man who fought against fascism, Leone Ginzburg. Leone Ginzburg was, very briefly, he was a Russian Jew. He was born in 1909. His family emigrated to Italy. He was of an amazing intelligence. Uh, when he was 18, he translated from Russian into Italian Anna Karenina of Tolstoy, which is 800, 900 pages. And transmitting and making uh, the best of European spirits by great literature accessible for everybody like what you're doing here in this library, that became his great passion. So he translated, he founded a publishing house, he set up a magazine called Cultura to do justice to the original meaning of the word, that is making room for the collection of the many roads people can travel in their search for the truth about themselves and human existence. Realizing that only culture can help people to figure out the truth about their own lives and actions this is why Leone Ginzburg made transmitting European culture his life's work. But then Mussolini and his gang come to power. Mussolini insists that all professors in a declaration of loyalty have to sign it, otherwise they will lose their job. This is a fact. Of the 1,100 professors in Italy, of the 1,100 professors in Italy, only 10 refused to sign the declaration of loyalty to Mr. Mussolini. Courage is a very rare phenomenon in the academic and intellectual world. Now, Ginsburg is one of them. He's one of the 10 who refuses, so he loses his job. He joins the resistance. He's arrested, he's deported. Mussolini is overthrown. Ginsburg returns to Rome. He fights against the Nazis, uh, but again he's arrested and then tortured to death by the Nazis. He's 35, only 35 when he dies. A letter he writes from the prison to his wife, Natalia, a letter which turned out to be his last letter, ends as follow. I quote, Dear Natalia, don't worry too much about me. Just imagine that I'm, that I'm a prisoner of war, and there are so many particularly in this war, and the great majority will return home. So let us hope that I'm part of that majority, right, Natalia? I kiss you again and again and again. Be brave. I will never forget my silent amazement when I read those words for the first time. Be brave. What did he mean by be brave? And I found the meaning of this salutation in Socrates, who teaches courage as the ability not to conquer others, but yourself. The courage to be wise and just. The courage to cultivate your soul. Whoever does not do this will not be free, and life without freedom, an empty and accommodating life is meaningless and ultimately loveless. So Natalia Ginsburg, she knew this. And so after the death of her husband, after the end of the war, she carried on her husband's work. She went to work in his publishing house. She wrote wonderful stories and essays, including a very short text entitled The Little Virtues. I'll read you the first two sentences of this essay. Natalia Ginsburg, I quote, as far as the education of children is concerned, I think they should be taught not the little virtues, but the great ones. Not thrift, but generosity and an indifference to money. 
Not caution, but courage and a contempt for danger. Not shrewdness, but frankness and a love of truth. Not tact, but the love of one's neighbor and self-denial. Not a desire for success, but a desire to be and to know. End of quote. Now, half a century later, we all know how true these words still are. In our society, we do not honor true human greatness. What we do honor is small-mindedness, stupidity, and triviality. And whoever excels in these things is, most of the time, extremely successful, whether it's politics, business, or education. Now, what has this to do with the return of fascism? Unfortunately, everything. Listen to what a great filmmaker and a friend of Natalia Ginsburg, Federico Fellini, has to tell us again after the war. I quote, Fascism always arises from a provincial spirit, a lack of knowledge of real problems, and people's refusal through laziness, prejudice, greed, or ignorance to give their lives deeper meaning. Worse, they boast of their ignorance and pursue success for themselves of their group through bragging, unsubstantial claims, and a false display of good characteristics, instead of drawing from true ability, experience, or cultural reflection. Fascism, Fellini continues, cannot be fought if we don't recognize that it is nothing more than the stupid, pathetic, frustrated side of ourselves and of which we should be ashamed. To curb that part of ourselves, we need more than activism or an anti-fascist party because latent fascism is hidden in all of us and at once gained a voice, political authority and trust and so it can do again and again. So let me end with making the following remarks. Fellini is unfortunately absolutely right. The fight against fascism is a fight against ignorance in ourselves. And the lessons to be learned, the universal lessons from the disasters in Europe for what should be done in the world, for me, are the following. First, the lessons of Socrates who taught us those two questions, which are the pillar of every civilization because they are the two big moral questions. What is a just way of life? And what is a good society? And of course, these questions are deeply intertwined. And the answer to this question, we have to find ourselves. Through, Socrates says, self-examination. That's where it starts and to accept the responsibility for your own life. Socrates, again, the highest aim is to live in freedom and never to fear freedom. But it is the difficult freedom, as you are only free if you can live your life in truth, do justice, create beauty, and have compassion. Now, this is never easy, so be brave, conquer yourself, and dare to apt for what is true, what has true value, because Spinoza is also right. Everything of excellence is as difficult as it is rare. Don't conform. Do not have a blind faith. Don't give away responsibility by obedience, but always be critical and live your own life. Strive for wisdom. Respect that life is sacred. Respect the richness of diversity and that no one Absolutely no one is in possession of the truth. Do understand that to live in truth, we have to accept changes because the living truth can only manifest itself in a, very, in, in a different way because the times are changing all the time. And last but not least, avoid kitsch, avoid crude materialism, avoid ignorance, but do honor the life of the mind the human spirit, and its eternal quest for meaning. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, uh, Rob, for this uh, vast and erudite uh, uh, tour d'horizon, as well as this profound uh, questioning. Uh, I'm struck by three things, if I may, besides from your closing appeal, which, of course, is very close to uh, everything I, I uh, value and we all value in this library, to think and to search and to learn and so on. Uh, two things. When you uh, said that, uh, uh, in the case of Leona Ginsburg, um, be brave, and that the highest form of uh, confrontation or, uh, uh, is to confront ourselves, uh, I am uh, reminded, of course, by, of the Prophet Muhammad's major definition, Rasulullah uh, Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam, jihad, Jihad al jihad al nafs. Said that the, the highest form of jihad is within yourself. It is not against something else, it's within yourself. And I think that's very much the be brave part. Confront. Confront what you refer to as fascism is hidden in all of us, what Fellini said. The second thing about Ginsburg writing, Leona Ginsburg writing that, uh, that last letter from his jail. I'm struck by somebody else who is one of my heroes and that regretfully people don't know enough about and most people should. Maybe Shayma here will know because she has a good French background. It's Condorcet. Uh, Condorcet uh, uh, was a brilliant man. He was an aristocrat at the time of the French Revolution. But he was very progressive. And he wrote amazing things. Uh, he wrote a long treatise about the education of girls and women as being a fundamental part of progress. Now we're talking 18th century. I mean, this is <laughs> and while on the run, because he was an aristocrat, he uh, sat uh, in, in hiding and he wrote one of the most fabulous documents ever, Reflections on Human Progress, which uh, is just amazing. And uh, he was then, he was running for his life. He was caught and uh, he was killed, tortured to death by the uh, revolution. Now you have to remember, this is the period of the French Revolution with the terror and the guillotine. And, and uh, it was the whole, well, all the image we have of the French Revolution and Maqsala, all, <laughs> all the stuff, people being killed. So Condorcet, uh, knowing pretty much, because he was a very smart guy, knowing pretty much that he was condemned, that he was being pursued in France by the revolutionary forces, he was an aristocrat of the old regime, yet his reflections on what was going on was a reflection on human progress. And it remains one of the most optimistic documents that you can read to this day. And in it, he predicted and he countered the thesis of, of, uh, of Malthus, that human beings were going to starve and so on and so forth. No, he said, no, human ingenuity, human technology, human collaboration, human cooperation will improve societies and ensure that people will not starve. Uh, that the, so he turned out, of course, to be right on all of those things. But it is amazing how some great souls confronted with great personal peril find within themselves the ability to reflect on the possibilities of human perfectibility, human improvement. So I think that, uh, and I'd like you to reflect on that before we take some questions, uh, Rob, uh, while uh, yes, we have to watch out for the devil that lurks within us. Uh, again, uh, from uh, the Holy Quran, I would uh, cite Nafsun wa Masawaha, Alhamaha Fujura wa Taqwaha. You know that uh, very well, that uh, ayah, uh, that we each have within ourselves uh, the demons as well as the better angels of our nature. And do we respond to the better angels of our nature or do we go with, uh, with uh, demons is a constant fight within ourselves. Uh, uh, but beyond that, there is this notion that yes, we can perfect ourselves. 
to the we can listen to the better angels of our nature. We can improve, and we can improve society by collective action. So uh, while you you rightly raise the warning flag, what do you see in European society today as optimism for that perfectibility side? What if Europeans were to listen to the better angels of their nature? Um, these are a lot of questions, so let me try to be uh, brief. Uh, first of all, um, I don't believe in, in historical laws. I, don't, I, I, I do not believe in cultural pessimism. I also do not believe in, in, in the law of progress. I consider us human beings to be free and that we have a responsibility. That's one thing. Secondly, um, I think that there is a kind of moral obligation to all of us to be optimists in the sense that pessimism will not lead us to anything. Now, having said these things, um, I started to make my notes for my essay on the eternal return of fascism because you have to understand the context of my society. Uh, I was born in 1962. I'm far beyond World War II. I never had that experience. And I'm part of a generation who grew up in an extremely prosperous society. You cannot imagine probably how extremely rich Dutch society is. I mean, you're poor in my country when you have to spend less than um, $1,500 a month. Then you're considered to be poor and there are all kinds of things to take care of you, etc., etc., etc. When I grew up in the 80s, we were demonstrating against uh, 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 no nukes everybody, against the, 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 the missiles of, of Reagan. Uh, we were in favor of Greenpeace, uh, for Amnesty International, etc., etc., etc. And we could imagine everything to happen except the return of the ghost. We were, in the 80s, all of us convinced never more nationalism, never more fascism. That's like the Middle Ages. That's over, that's past. We went beyond that. Now, one generation later, all of us have to admit it's there again. And so I was so puzzled by the question, how is it possible? So rich, so many possibilities, such a wonderful educational system, healthcare system, social security system, etc., etc. No external threats, no hunger. What's happening? And it made me realize fascism does not come from an economic crisis. The economic crisis can encourage things, can, 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 can put things in an even worse directions, but the economic crisis, my fellow uh, uh, Dutchman Menno de Braak is right, it's not, the, the root is, the root are a crisis of civilization. Now, one of the root problems, and this relates to uh, 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 your first remark about uh, uh, this wise uh, uh, saying of, of the prophet Mohammed, that jihad is the fight in yourself. Um, all my intellectual heroes uh, in, the 19, in the 20th century have been think, had to think about this question about the unity of mankind. And again, it was an, 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 it, it, it's a religious concept, but, but, but they had to think about it in, in, in a secular context. And the question is, what is it that unites us human, as human beings? And they start to realize that the, mo that the only thing that can pro protect us from all those powers, ideas, and ideologies who want to divide us in black and white, rich and poor, uh, 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 Jews or Muslim, atheists or Christians or whatever, are universal values. When we, at the very moment we give up universal values, we will be lost and we are open, the, the gate will be open for all those forces, including capitalism, which reduces us so much to, you know, you're only good when you make money, and if you are not make money, we can get rid of you. And this is, this is one of the things we've lost. And so I think that, 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 that one of the things we intellectuals, fellow intellectuals, have to realize is that, that one of our fights should be against all those ideologies, political ideas, political parties who want to divide us in the good and the bad and the ugly.
It is written, and, and, and again, I, you mentioned in your very flattering introduction, I must say, uh, uh, about it. I made a note of, 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 of the misuse of words. Uh, democracy is... <laughs> no, no, but, 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 but that's, so we can talk about democracy, we, talk, we can talk about freedom, you can also talk about the notion of jihad and how it's used and misused. Um, and so, 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 so that's, now, what, what, what makes me optimistic about uh, uh, the present situation in uh, 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 Europe? Um, that's a hard question because the situation is more or less deteriorating by the day. Um, again, when I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, the EU was self-evident, self-evident. Of course, you know, we will always be united, we will grow, and now we even got the Nobel Prize, which is, of course, a curse uh, when you get the Nobel Prize for peace. Um, uh, because the thing is, the, the thing might fall apart. And an, the, what we discussed this afternoon was an... an, an Europe is what we call the Balkanization. In my country, we is such a small, tiny country. Um, there are two provinces who want to claim their own independence. They do want to claim their own because their own identity, etc., etc., etc. So identities are, and Belgium, and so and, and and Italy, and and Spain, and Scotland, and there you go. So, an, an, uh, uh, um, what actually is the case is that, well, first thing, first of all. My claim is, and it might be true for this country as well, but I say this with a certain uh, uh, distance to it, the elites will not help us because the elites are the problem. They are the problem. And it's the political elite, the financial elite, the media elite, the educational elite, they are the problem. And they are the problem not necessarily because they are evil people or bad people or whatever, um, but, but it's because their paradigm. There are, there are certain profound things they are not able to understand. I mean, it's this horrible thing in Davos, the World Economic Forum, where all those very rich celebrity bullshitters, if I may say, come together and, 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 and refuse to acknowledge the fact that their own mindset is the core of the problem. So that's, that's, that's one thing we are dealing with. We are dealing with a huge problem that is the the ignorance of our elites. The second thing is that uh, 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 um, we intellectuals are co-responsible for the fact that instruments people need to deal with these issues are no longer there. What have we been doing to our publishing houses, to our universities, to our public media, etc., etc., etc.? Now. The good news is, this is what I learned through my work at the, at the Nexus Institute, there is a growing, huge and fast growing group of people, especially among the young, who know that they are fooled by the system, who know that they are fooled by their own elites, who know that a different society and a different way to live is possible. But they are lacking the instruments. And I think, and then I can, because I, I, I'm absolutely convinced of it. We need libraries like this library. We, we need, you know, uh, uh, small independent things. We need more people who are brave and so can give those instruments to those people so that the people themselves can unite and in more or less grassroots operations as you have been doing since January last year, you know, get rid of the old class and become responsible for your own life. And that's, that's the thing we have to do in Europe as well. Thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, one or two questions from the floor. Yes, please, over here, then I'll go over there. Please, yeah. start. I am a low man. Your lecture is more hot than the weather outside. In your lecture, you concentrated on Philosopher like Socrates and Hegel and so and so. The way to be for democracy is to follow the saying of philosopher or follow the saying of politicians or at, uh, at doctors may say the region. How? How we can realize democracy? You have said at last by, by indiv individuals to, to be free in your opinion, 
to get work, to get job. In your point of view, how to realize democracy? Well, there is, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, the point is as follows. Um, In the 20s, okay. In the 20s of the uh, 20th century, uh, there was this odd phenomenon that Europe was getting rid of the impact of the church, of feudalism, etc., etc., etc. There was this growing movement of democracy all over Europe. This was around the turn of the century. Not much later. Europe turned fallen, you know, by its own free will to totalitarianism. I mean, Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, millions of people, millions of people wanted to believe that they were their savior. So the point I want to make is we do know by now that democracy has this awful capacity to commit suicide. And we are, in my perception, at the very beginning, again in Europe, in committing suicide by, by on the, our free base, say, we no longer want to be democratic. The mo in, in, in Italy, you see it already happening. Apparently, we did not learn the lessons of the past. Now, and, but what is the main thing we did not learn is that democracy is much more than just free speech, free vote, uh, free newspapers, etc. It has to be carried by a certain spirit. And the spirit is a spirit which is based on I want to be truly free. Free, not in the sense that I can do whatever I want, but that you realize that to be really free is this kind of respect Spinoza and the others have been talking about. It's the difficult freedom. It is to realize I have to educate myself, I have to be responsible, I have to know how to argue. There, are, there, is, there is an ignorance I cannot allow myself, otherwise I will give in. So that's, that's the point. Yeah. Democracy is a big and difficult thing. Um, we have got some theories like the liberal peace theory or the democratic peace which stated that democracies do not go to fight against each other or rather do not go to wars against each other. So it, given the fact that it's pretty much true, I'm not saying that it's completely true, but it's pretty much, I mean, abiding to the, to the fact that we can see every day. But given this fact, do you think that the process of, uh, of a democratization, a sincere democratization to some societies, and again, I'm mentioning only a society, not the state, um, does this act as a counter um, factor against fascism in societies? Do you think so? Do, do you think that reaching a, um, a sense of cognitive liberty to the individual and to the society will be um, a sort of, 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 a, of an act of, of a counter against fascism or not? I wish you were right, but I fear uh, you're, you're not right. And, and, and regretfully, you're not right. Um, because, you know, there are too many facts uh, uh, pointing in a different way. Again, the Netherlands is, is a very, very free society in every respect. And yet, uh, we have just come out of a government where millions of people voted for Mr. Wilders, who is basically against any form of democracy. His whole policy was the, sca the scapegoat, the Muslims. And so he was uh, 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 spreading the hatred all the time. Uh, he was um, against the freedom of speech. He was in favor of that it would only be Dutch music on Dutch uh, radio because you can't have music from... But, and all these things, and again, it, it happened on a, on a deliberate basis uh, in a complete free society. Then have a look at the political situation now in the United States of America where the political system is completely broke, completely broke. And, an, and, and everybody is that knows that this elite there in Washington is not acting in the common interest of the American people. They are there to protect their own interests. So again, democracy comes with a certain moral code, with a certain intellectual and moral integrity. And when it's not there, it's an empty shelf and just a code word to do whatever you want to do.
Hussam Abu Isa of Tahrir. Uh, there is a comment about uh, dictatory and uh, democracy. The, the harm of uh, dictatory it means uh, wars, uh, many wars, many victims, many revolutions, many protests. But if uh, the harm of dictatory is uh, uh, harm to humanity and the victims, the dictatory is not person, it is system. It means that not Hitler, not uh, Mussolini, not uh, Stalin, even in Arabian Revolution, uh, not Bashar al-Assad, not Hosni Mubarak, the, dictator, the dictatory is system. It means that the system contains uh, secure institution, intelligent, uh, intelligent uh, institution, uh, thinker, uh, philosophers, uh, letters. Thus, the reason of the power of dictatory is the system, not the person, because now you said that uh, Hitler and and uh, Stalin are the sign of dictatory. But the, the, the Hitler and Mussolini in uh, Arabian or uh, al-Assad or Hosni Mubarak in Arabian Revolution or whatever, the reason is system, the effect of system. Thus, the solution is adjustment the mentality of system to avoid, to remove dictatory to democracy. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, but look, uh, let me let me let me remind you that a system always consists of human beings. We are a system. We are a system. Look at again what's going on now uh, with this financial crisis uh, 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 in Western society. In Spain, there is an unemployment of over 25%. Young people are unemployed by 50%. Portugal, the same. Italy, the same. France is growing. Uh, in the United States of America, it's, it's, it, you know, we see this thing, and it's due to the system. But the system consists of people who are not taking their responsibility, who you know, well, yes, I'm a banker, and if I don't do this, we, we will not make enough profit, and so our competitors, and da, 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 da. But that's, again, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. Things will only change if people accept the fact that they all have a responsibility, and that there is a universal responsibility, and that you cannot hide between, behind corporate identity, or my group, or my family, or whatever which is all nonsense. So again, the whole systems consist of human beings. And at the very moment you become active in, 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 in a certain group and you remain silent or you do not act or whatever, you're co-responsible. Thank you, I think we'll take the last question, Dr. Azza, and then I have a comment. Um, I just have a question. It's, it seemed to me that you were describing the post modern condition, if I may quote. <laughs> and um, it, it also uh, seems to me that you're saying that this postmodern condition is bringing us back to the racial nationalism and you know the fascist regimes in Europe. Um, I would like to ask you if you think that a return to the liberal humanist tradition which existed in Europe before um, you know the end of 19th and early 20th century, can resolve these issues and if perhaps the new elite can adopt these ideas, would they be, um, would, would they be able to lend a helping hand in that case? Thank you. Well, uh, uh, um, this is a beautiful way to introduce my topic for tomorrow <laughs> because <laughs> this is exactly what I want to talk about uh, tomorrow when we do our seminar on, on, on books and knowledge. No, but you're absolutely right. It is, it is as if, uh, uh, um, you know, as if we're moving into circles. And because there are too many similarities between what we now call, in a very sophisticated way, postmodernism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but in its root, it's a form of nihilism. And Nietzsche was, you know, uh, the turning point in European history when, when, when I mean, he suffered, in my perspective, most of it himself when he read to realize, when he read to realize what kind of society we were moving in, and that. 
to give you one example, not that long ago, uh, a guest at my institute was George Steiner, and he spoke about the meaning of universitas. What is the, what is the essence of a university? And he said, one of the things he said, he said, the essence of a university is that you have a huge passion for what's useless, because the most important things in life are useless. Music is useless, love is mu useless, friendship is useless, etc. But we all turned our society in, it has to be useful. You know, your subsidies, the things you're doing, you know, you have to prove and make concrete that's useful. Now, this kind of stupidity, uh, 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 that's the thing we have to get rid of. And indeed, we have to go back to, to an older legacy of universal values, of cosmopolitan ideas, which, and uh, because if you, if you go into European history, and, 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 and Ismail Sheraj Aldin has written beautifully about it, the connections between the world of Islam and Christianity and Jewish history and the Enlightenment, it's all there. There is a kind of universal wisdom and a kind of uni universal knowledge, and it's our duty to get this back. Thank you, Rob. I, um, yes, I do very much. Want, I wanted to end very much on this note. I'm glad you, you brought it up. And uh, that is uh, the notion of a cosmopolitanism that uh, uh, Alexandria, and I say this because we are in Alexandria and all of you are Alexandrians. Alexandria, whether ancient Alexandria or even fairly recent Alexandria from the 19th and 20th centuries, at least till the first half of the 20th century, had a remarkable quality. And this was that it was truly a cosmopolitan city. Cosmopolitanism in the sense that you had Greeks and Italians and Armenians and Syrians and so on. And they had an incredibly productive uh, uh, theater, film, uh, uh, journals in their own languages, in many, many, many languages that were produced here and theater and uh, essays and art and poetry. And these communities also had their religious structures, their leadership structures. But the most amazing thing, and that's what makes cosmopolitanism so different from what is happening now in Europe, as we were saying, is that they were all living as citizens. And, uh, you know, uh, you were Syrian and I was Greek, then so we would have lunch in the Syrian club and then we'd have dinner in the Greek club and uh, I would have Greek poetry and you would have uh, uh, Syrian, etc. That diversity was there and coexisted and enriched that society. Now we're talking about these communities saying, I want to be different. I want to have nothing to do with you. I want to be autonomous and independent. I mean, we're just talking about two provinces in the Netherlands. We're talking about the, the uh, Walloons and the Flemish uh, and, and in, 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 in Belgium. You talk about the Basque in, in, in Spain, et cetera, et cetera. All of this idea of saying we separate ourselves. Now, luckily, I believe, for example, that in Egypt at least, we have a stronger common identity that will withstand efforts by anybody to the Egyptians have been pretty much occupying the same space for about 7,000 years. They've been conquered, they've been uh, 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 transformed, they've intermingled with all sorts of people, but they are Egyptians. They spoke different languages at different times, they believed different beliefs, but fundamentally, there's a very strong tie that keeps us together. But that is not the case around us. Look what happened to Sudan. Look what happened to Somalia. Look what happened to Iraq, which is pretty much still okay. It's one country, but it's more or less divided into three. I mean, we all know that, et cetera, et cetera. So these dangers of which Rob speaks are general global dangers. I mean, Europe, is the paradigm in which this is happening because we had hoped that Europe after the Second World War, as he said when, uh, I'm a little bit older than, than you, but uh, uh, we thought that Europe had actually found the magic answer. That uh, w unlike the melting pot of America, it was to be a new form of cosmopolitanism. Germans would remain Germans, French would be French, Italians would be Italians, and all would be Europeans. 
and it was this image that brilliant thinkers like, uh, like Monet and Schumann could come right after the killing fields of the Second World War and hold up this vision of a society, and they succeeded. They succeeded because within a generation, it would be impossible for young Germans and young Frenchmen to think that their countries could ever go to war with each other. Their parents could not imagine peace between their countries because they had fought the war of 1870, they fought the war of 1914, they fought the war of 1939. So the idea in the 1940s that you would create eternal peace and that the Franco-German alliance would become the motor of European it would, would have been almost beyond belief at the time. Yet visionaries in Europe were able to bring forth that. And in the great phrase of Abraham Lincoln, they called to the better angels of our nature. And they were able to get an echo from all the people. Now the question is, where are such people today? Where are such visions today? Where are the, the voices that will raise these profound human values. As Rob says, if you look back in history, they are there. We need to bring them together. And we in Egypt, in this period of enormous transition, need to remember the profound humanism and also one thing, which is that democracy, the democracy for which this revolution started, the democracy that we all want, Democracy requires pluralism, and the pluralism requires difference of opinion. And we have to learn not just to respect and tolerate, but to love that and defend it and enjoy it. A demokratia tahtag it ta'adudia. With ta'adudia ta'ani al ikhtilaf. When somebody disagrees with me, he wants to vote against the Muslim Brotherhood, he wants to vote with the Muslim, he wants to vote with the Salafis, he wants to vote with the Hezb uh, al the left party. Doesn't matter. He's entitled to his views. Let us talk about these views. I may convince you, you may convince me. Civilized discourse, richness of opinion, discussion of our problems. I think this is the spirit that democracy is all about. This is the spirit that in this library we have maintained from day one where we allowed debates and discussions on many, many issues. And we need it today more than ever. It's different from confrontations that you see in many of these cable channels and so on. I'm talking about there's a difference between debate and dialogue. Debate is you are scoring points against the other side. You want him to make, to, to make him look stupid in front of the audience. You want your point of view to prevail, etc. In dialogue, I am willing to learn. I may change my view as a result of listening to the other side. So debating is not the same as dialogue. And I think what we want for a true democratic spirit is that openness to dialogue, not that refusal to learn, uh, the refusal to understand, which is embedded in fascism the refusal to, to learn, the refusal to understand, and in a great American uh, funny comment, but which is tragically true, my mind is made up, don't confuse me with facts. <laughs> That's a famous story. <laughs> and, and I think we have been warned by, by Rob about the experience of Europe, and I want you all to join me in thanking Rob Riemann for this wonderful, wonderful afternoon.